we society would change so hard to find. Changing our ways and actions is a simple change of mind. I'm gonna say it again. How are we society would change so hard to find? Changing our ways and actions is a simple change of mind. Surely to be found with enough grit, time, and devotion. We have to look within and learn that we're more than our emotions. Inspire, teach, and preach. Let's get the movement in motion. Society got us all drinking the Kool-Aid and we not worried about the potion. We have to be the light and uplift. If intentions are right, join the fight and raise a fist. What I know is, is I'm American and my America can't stay like this. I'm American and my America ain't staying like this. I, what I hear the three of you saying is, here we are, young black men wanting to do something good. Help us help you. <laughs> Show us how we can do it. I got we want to do something about that. <laughs> is that kind of what I'm hearing? Or am I not hearing that correctly? No, you're hearing it crystal clear. <laughs> okay. And I would love to work with you on that. Peace, peace, and love, justice, and black power. My name is Boss Man Kais. Thank you all for being here with us today as we collectively draft articles for reparations for not only the state, but also where we don't often uh, focus our local intentions on at the city, county, and neighborhood association levels. Um, we brought this, this framework of protest together for the simple fact that, you know, a lot of us are tired of saying their names and we are looking for alternative ways to express our uh, determination and dedication to liberation. Um, so my organization, the Black Army Brigade, is a community-rooted organization that provides leadership development opportunities and economic empowerment strategies for historically Black American youth that identify as ADOS or descendant of enslaved or the chattel enslavement practices that were here on this American terrain. And I like to differentiate that when you know giving context because often we are generalized once we get to you know ascribing to different labels and stuff and you know a lot of our story and significance and importance to you know the the, the liberties that a lot of other community ethnically diverse communities experience it gets overshadowed once we get to conglomerating all of these identity sectors that you know include not only your orientation but also your where you're coming from, where you're, all, all of those identity markers, you know. Um, so to differentiate that, we like to be an inclusive, but also really distinct um, when we're describing and, and creating space, collective ad addressment for, you know, intercommunal conflict. We, we are excited to be able to bring to you guys the Black Communal Legislative Assembly. What it is, it's a replica of the state legislature and what we're doing here today is we're going to collectively draft articles of reparations by a framework that we use called community inspired resolutions uh, that will be proposed by our community representatives. So the community representatives are going to be everybody that registers and comes through. You will be able to, you'll be given an opportunity to come up to the mic, um, present your community inspired resolution, and then uh, step back for community feedback and responses. Um, I encourage everybody to go to tinyurl.com forward slash black communal assembly. We have a, a host of um, community leaders, community artists um, that'll be sharing with you guys uh, different forms of black expression. Uh, we'll have a family discussion here at the end of the day with um, that'll be facilitated by the Black Family Blueprint, Adrian and Io Mack. Um, we'll have a, a list of speakers from Black Civic Network, Black Women's Wealth Alliance. So what this is, is a protest. Um, this is a form of protest. It's a new, new model that actually has not been tried really since the founding of this America when they was talking about give me liberty or give me death. Mm -hmm. And you know, we are in a state of emergency, especially here in the Twin Cities, um, where police can't keep their lead out of our bodies and their knees off our necks. Um, and we got state, uh, state um, elected officials 
who play the political games with our lives. And you know, it's at a point of reparations or revolution. Listen. And that's what we're offering here is that type of framework to begin that process for institutional independence, economic uh, development opportunities, accessing holistic health care, uh, equity in our educational opportunities, and a political infrastructure for better representation. Those are the five main buckets that we'll be talking about. So it's to our benefit to make sure that black women are secure, protected, respected, loved, and that they thrive. Because their thriving means we have a living chance to thrive as a nation. You have no black community without the black woman. Period. Doesn't matter who. We're talking about business, etc. Everything we all do matters. Everything. And it's all connected. But what we also have to connect is our economic strategies and movement as a people. Everything we have and has ever had has always come from us. We've had no handouts. We've had no reparations. We've had no bonus checks, right? We have been the ingenuity and the economic engine of this country. I know they say this is a nation of immigrants. No, this is a nation of indigenous and hardworking black folks Listen. who have laid pure foundation and still providing ingenuity and power to this country. Now the black dollar circulates an average of six hours in our community. An average of six hours. Part of our goal is to make that dollar circulate for 60 days before it leaves our communities. Well, what does that mean? That means that we have to create more businesses that support the way we spend money. Most of the businesses in our community do not represent how we spend money. Where do you buy your shoes? Where do you buy your furniture? Where do you buy your clothes? Where do you buy your household products? Where do you go sit down and eat at? And the majority of the times is not in your community. That's not where you get your massages. That's not where you go get your tuxedo. So it is our job to understand how we use money as a people and to create businesses and services around that. That's how we retain the money. If we don't provide our people with the type of services that we need and use, then we have no way to keep our money and create jobs for ourselves inside. We have to move away from just shaking trees. We are great at shaking trees. We are strong advocates, activists. That's part of our legacy in this country, and we should continue it raising our voices there's no question about that that's from the civil rights era but so the reason why a lot of them were executed is because they began to move in the economic era which is part of our work today which means that we not only shake trees where and have fruit falling everywhere right people with baskets catching it they catching it, right? But but see, those people ain't us. White folks and other people, they, they, they got the baskets. We shaking the trees. We got all the power to burn that tree down, to bust it down, and all the fruit is going to drop. But we're not the ones catching it to implement the very ideas and goals that we have. That was part of the civil rights era. The other part that's part of our job to carry forward is the economic aspect of that era. That means we now develop baskets so that we are the ones catching it. We are the beneficiaries of the very fruit of our own labor. That means we have to develop the infrastructure of businesses, of services. We have to purchase more land. We have to be more conscious. We cannot afford to look good and do bad. Listen. Our future depends on it.
We are established as spiritual, creative artists, great people. But we're also established as the economic engines to everybody else's vehicle except our own. Say that part. We're loving good people, but it's time to invest in ourselves more. And this is part of what it looks like. Not just supporting a black business that's gonna go out there and spend all their money with everybody who ain't black. We want responsible business owners who are going to create jobs in our community, but also reinvest their money by spending with other black vendors as well. So one might want to know what does it mean to be a lifetime national Ms. Kwanzaa? And that means that not only do you have the title, but that means that you are so enthused about the title that you work very hard with the platform because you are extremely passionate about spreading the word and advocating about Kwanzaa as a way of life. We'll save ourselves just like we did in the Civil War. We got plenty of fight in us. Now the reality is we have to become cognizant of our power. That's what we're here to talk about today. Reparations is not a handout, it's a debt, it's a bill, it's due like the lights, water, rent, mortgage. That's who we are to this country. They're built on us. We have to understand that. And in order to thoroughly understand that, you have to understand your history. When we won our right to freedom in the Civil War, we had a thing called the Freedmen's Bureau. We had uh, special field order number 15 from General Sherman, ratified by Congress, signed by President Abraham Lincoln, that started with the southeast corner of the United States, designated to black people in perpetuity with sole autonomy. Did you hear what I said? We had land. It was ours. It was written that no one was to come there and rule but us. And of course, Lincoln was assassinated. Andrew Johnson repealed all of that and paid the slave masters reparations because we won our freedom. And if that don't boil your blood, then you probably ain't from this blood and you need to be quiet and figure out how to get in tune and get educated. We are still forced to live under taxation without representation. Still forced to live that way. We didn't even know what it was when we were in the South and you couldn't go into a public school that your taxes paid for. You couldn't play in a public park that your taxes paid for. Couldn't go in a public library that your taxes paid for. Couldn't go in a college or university where taxes was allowed to be spent, but you couldn't even go. And we're still dealing with taxation without representation. When you live in this state and you produce more than $4 billion a year and you can't ask or demand 10,000 of where you want it to go, which means the white majority spends all their tax money on what they want and then turn around and spend all yours on what you want from the city council, to the mayor, to the county attorney, to the judges, to the jury. It was basically impossible. Thank God this telephone came along and you can expose them. Now, why is that needed? Because the conversation was the Negro has no rights that the white man must respect or honor. And as long as he felt that way, we needed that phone that that young girl had at a corner when George Floyd was murdered. This state has been Jim Crow up north, although I must admit, everything is south after Canada, and I'm clear on that, that nothing in the government has changed. It sickens me that my people think one party is better than the other. Democrat is so-called better than the Republican. Some think Republican is better than the Democrat. The truth be known, they've both been in office. they both had power. they both had the majority of elected officials, and they both failed us for decades and generations in this country. And some of the things we talked about was we don't need just a million dollars that we can spend up in a week or two. We need a point system so that we decide on a certain amount of money, we need to decide, but that's only one point. Because we work this land for free, we should be given a certain amount of acreage of land that we agree on, but that's only one point. Because we built so many of your dwellings that you live in, in the beginning, to establish this country. We should have a $150,000, $250,000 house, but that's only one point. The fact that we live under taxation without representation so long, we should be exempt from paying America's tax. Amen. 
the fact that you send us to wars in this world to fight people across the world that have never touched black people. We should be exempt from your wars that don't benefit us in any way. Even if you lie and say you're fighting for their freedom, we come home and still ain't got ours. So when you understand that, you need in your reparations a point system that says you discriminated, denied us the right to work, which caused many of our men to begin to go to jail. So no gun warehouses, no gun stores, no gun pawn shops in North Minneapolis. So who is it that brings all the guns to innocent children, brand new guns, and dumps them off to our children along with the bullets and bulletproof vests? We need a point system to protect ourselves from that type of treachery. This country. Once again, I'm Deja Joel, and I'm going to lead you through a little bit of a healing session. Um, let me let you know of three things that are always available to you during this session. The first thing is your breath, inhaling through your nose, exhale through your mouth. We'll do that one more time. Inhale, exhale. Hey, that feels so good. The second thing that's always available to you is hand over heart. Sometimes we give so much love to other people, we're unable to feel our own love. Yes, hand over heart is being able to rest in your own embrace, being able to feel yourself and touch yourself and being able to rest inside of yourself. Yes, that's the second thing that's always available to you. And you can add those two things together, hand over heart, inhaling, exhaling, as many times as you like. Yes, the third thing that's always available to you is words of affirmation. When you hear the echo of Mahmoud al Khaji talking about wealth in terms of our young people, echoing what the Akan people believe, what comes to mind when you think about wealth in our young people? Man, uh, what, came, what came to mind for me was this mantra that um, me and my peers tend to use often. We like to say the wise are young and the young are wise. And, and I think that it's, it's always important that whatever we're doing, that there's always the um, intergenerational component that is ever present. And all that I do with the scholars, I'm always reminding them that it's always an, um, um, a two-way street. As a question, a chew on, what is wealth? What is it? Now, Miss. Jackson opened it up in terms of the visibility of what communities look like, but I'm gonna spin more onto that. When you drive into, and I'm gonna just give you this one statistic so we can, all of us can name down probably 15 that helps to describe the circumstances of what black folks are in in the Twin Cities. But right now, black folks only make up one third of the median income that white families make up in the um, Minnesota and in the Twin Cities specifically, one third, which means that if uh, European Americans in this uh, Twin Cities make seventy to seventy-five thousand dollars. Black folks is only making anywhere between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars on the dollar for them. What I know is the importance of arts integration into these freedom movements. How imperative it is to have artists as a part of this conversation um, on a scientific level in terms of the vibration, and on a historic level in terms of our people always calling back to the drum and just on a movement-based level in terms of the history of our people and the ways in which art makes these movements progress forward. Some of these things that we're talking about and the delivery in which we use these things, we can convey these messages in and through the arts, different forms of arts, right? Brother Pac, Tupac. And the message that he was delivering, albeit, you know, different folks had different ideas and feelings, about the way in which he was delivering that message. One of the reasons why I believe we don't have this brother, one of, this, one of the reasons why we can investigate and learn and see why we don't have this brother is because what this brother was doing was inspiring us to get the knowledge, to go and get the knowledge and understand the impact that we have on this world, understand the power that we hold in this world, understand the power that we have when we come together and actually start to build our wealth. Insert hip hop, insert the hustle, insert the ingenuity of our people and the creativity of our people. This is where like, again, my self interest lies in terms of the art. For a history lesson, we all, I'm, I hope you know, and if you don't know, I'm gonna tell you right now. The way in which hip hop started, it started as a hustle. It started as a sister and a brother trying to figure out how to make some bread to go to school. They were, you know, you know the threads, right? You needed to be fly, you needed to have fly threads on the first day of school. So they threw a party and they was like, you know, we're gonna charge this at the door and get cats to come through. 
Similar situation in the hood, man. Cass was running, you know, Cass was running, trying to find guidance, so on, so forth, whatever. In the height of the crack epidemic, in the height of, you know, post the, what folks call the black power movement, the civil rights era, where we had some consciousness around ourselves and around what we needed to do to get free. So these folks are living in the height of this thing, right? This party gets thrown, that the, the culture is born in that sense. It's in a sense of entrepreneurship, in a sense of black intellect, in a sense of community, tribe, etc., and figuring out a way to get through and survive, you know, a burning neighborhood, right? And being systemically placed inside of a ghetto. Creating a culture and leaning back into a culture that's been innate and has existed in us ad infinity, okay? The thing, the thing that makes hip hop an important part of this story in terms of posse, tribe, and crew is that hip hop is arguably, arguably, especially by 1983 when the message popped out, hip hop is and was arguably the greatest form of counter culture, counter narrative, and counter media that the world has ever seen, ever. When the message came out, what the message did would show people what conditions were really like in the hood. Globally, the message around the United States of America was this utopia, this phenomenal white space. Every day was fireworks, picket fences, and nuclear families running through grassy fields. But the message came out, and that video came out, and what you saw was the epidemic going down in the hood. You saw the destitute conditions that black people were placed in after white flight, because of the fear of black people and black bodies and black existence and black intellect and the inability to control all of that energy and all of that greatness. So what the message did was shatter all of that. And that was a collective effort. Hip hop was a collective effort. It was about our genius, our inventiveness, our art and our creative expression. But specifically we were telling some truths Back to this facts only thing. What that video did was show facts only. The narration, the content, what they were speaking to was facts only. There was no exaggeration about that. So our responsibility as artists and as a people is to bring all of these elements together. We seen Brother Louis earlier speaking facts, inspiring people to look into themselves. The things that the brother before me, Brother Thomas was speaking to, facts. That's the kind of message that needs to be spreading. So it's the responsibility of us as young artists to be incorporating those facts into the music so that the people who are listening to us, who are absorbing the things that we're saying, who are rocking and learning, it's, it's science, yo. We learn in rhythm. That's the easiest way for us to learn. We learn in rhythm and rhyme. So for those of us who decide to pick up pens and become poets, it is our responsibility to tell the truth about our people so that as our little babies are around us, you know what I'm saying, two-stepping and whatnot and so on and so forth, they're carrying on this message for the future. You want us to come up here and drop facts for you so you can ignore the facts? I can talk to you all day long about what white people are doing. Y'all simply just don't care. Because as long as white people can make you feel good, you're going to stay in the position that you're in. Because you feel good. Whether it's feeling good in the bedroom, feeling good when they legalize marijuana, feeling good at the 200 or the 4th Street where you know people are being gunned down, feeling good in your community, sitting outside while three year olds are catching bullets in the head. Um, I specifically wanted to speak about schools, especially here in Minnesota. Sounds good. Um, and that just being because um, growing up in a smaller part of Minnesota, you know that there's not that much diversity. So in order to get that diversity, you've got to come closer to the city. So um, a little bit about me is that I have a mantra where you got to be who you needed when you were younger. And something in the schools that I would say that is definitely needed is, um, is some like an organization bringing forth information and knowledge and support specifically to the, not just the black children, but the children of color that are in these schools that are predominantly white and they don't fit in and they don't feel like they have a home and they're having trouble adjusting or they're getting bullied and they're 
getting called um, racial slurs every day? How do they handle that? How do they balance their mental health while still trying to be a student for 40 hours a week and then go home, you know, and um, building that plat and building a space for them to be able to um, communicate their frustrations or fears or even their just personal opinions um, about about their experience with going to a school that's predominantly white and just um, allowing them to be able to express themselves unapologetically is something very, very important. And that's something that, and that's personally something that I went through and I wasn't able to get that through, <laughs> I wasn't able to get that through the school that I was raised in with as much love. And I would say that that is a, something that's definitely needed. And, and that's all. <laughs> We did it. We did it. We did it.